From 11FS, this is Fintech Insider News, and I am your host, Benjamin Ensor. We're covering some big stories this week, so buckle up, listeners. We are talking about Smart raising $95 million to take on the pension market internationally. Smart has built a successful business in the UK, helping pension savers directly, but it's also building a platform to work with other companies to help pension savers worldwide. Secondly, we talked about Robinhood launching 24-hour trading. Is this the democratization of stock investing by giving uh, retail investors equal access to the markets? Or does it risk traders getting addicted to the markets and watching their phones and watching the markets all the way through the night? And former UK Chancellor George Osborne is to chair an Italian investment firm. George Osborne has taken on a large number of jobs, so we talked about how many jobs is too many and what would the panelists' favourite dream second job be. So you need to guess which one of our panellists said they wanted to be a presenter on UK children's TV programme, Blue Peter. So we'll get into all of this and much more on today's show. So let's dive in. But first, a few brief messages. We'll be back shortly. Hello, lovely listeners. We just wanted to let you know that Global Processing Services, otherwise known as GPS, the payments platform trusted by the leading issuers to process billions of transactions a year, have changed their name to Thread. Why Thread? Well, Thread because their tailored payment processing solutions are the thread that connects payments innovators of the future. Thread because they are a true partner becoming part of the fabric of your business as it grows. And Thread because, well, it just feels right. Find out more at thread.com. That's T-H-R-E-D-D.com. Thread. Weaving payments magic. Hello and welcome, LFG people, to Fintech Insider. Blockchain Insider. 11FS Spotlight. 11FS Explores. Open mic night. After dark. Through our podcasts, videos, newsletters, and live events, we have a direct line to a truly global fintech community. So if you're looking to sponsor and collaborate on content that connects with everybody from fintech beginners to the biggest VCs, then chat to our team at sponsors at 11fs.com or visit 11fs.com to find out more. Long live the community. Welcome to episode 740 of Fintech Insider. I'm Benjamin Ensor, Director of Research and Strategy at 11FS, and I'm joined this week on Fintech Insider News by three great guests to break down this week's biggest stories in fintech and financial services. Firstly, it's my 11FS colleague, Kate Moody, Customer Strategy Director at 11FS. Hello, Kate. Have you been working on anything interesting you can tell our listeners a little bit about? That's one of the both like great and not so great things about a lot of the work that we do with our clients, right? Like often they have very exciting briefs about big things they want to do in the future. So often we can't talk about the details until things are actually out of market. Um, But yeah, no, working on some very interesting things at the moment around the sort of pensions, long-term saving space. So I'm sure we might touch on that today. Uh, And also sort of helping some colleagues ramp up for a new project starting in the Middle East, designing a new bank in the Middle East. So some really nice, interesting contrast there. Fantastic. Up next, we have a welcome return to Fintech Insider for Sophie Winwood, Investment Principal at Anthemis. Welcome back to the show, Sophie. It's always a delight to have you on. Can you remind listeners who've not heard you before about who you are and your role at Anthemis, please? Yeah, absolutely. And thanks so much for for having me back on. Um, I work at Anthemis. We are a venture capital fund focused on everything to do with the future of financial services. So fintech and shortech and all relevant adjacencies, um, investing across multiple different stages across the UK, Europe and the US. Thank you. And finally, we have a Fintech Insider debut for Dan Barker, Chief Marketing Officer at Smart. Thank you so much for joining us, Dan. Uh, We'll get into your story in in a moment, but can you give uh, our listeners a short introduction to you and Smart Pension, please? Thanks so much. It's great to be speaking to you all today. Um, So yeah, I'm Dan Barker, Chief Marketing Officer at Smart, and uh, I've been with the business since the start. I began as a consultant and then over the years became Chief Marketing Officer. Uh, Smart sits in a couple of different areas. So in the UK, it's a direct pension scheme with more than a million savers uh, and more than 70,000 employers. And then beneath that is a a great fintech business. And the fintech portion, the platform, is also used across the world. So it's rolled out in the Middle East, uh, partnering with Zurich, in Ireland, with the Bank of Ireland. And then we're also present over in the States and in Asia. Fantastic. Well, welcome to the show. And with that, let's get into the news. 
So our first story is about Smart. Uh, This was reported in City AM, uh, and it is that London pension fintech Smart is gearing up for deals after a $95 million funding injection. London-based pensions fintech firm Smart has said it's gearing up for a flurry of deal-making, having bagged a $95 million, £76 million funding round from big-name backers, including New York-based outfit Aquiline. Smart closed the Series E funding round led by Aquiline alongside investors including Chrysalis Investments, Fidelity International Strategic Ventures and Barclays. The deal marks one of the biggest for fintech firms this year. Smart is among a host of fintech firms that have sprung up in the UK to capitalise on a move to take control of retirement savings. So Dan, thank you so much uh, for joining us uh, to discuss this. So first of all, congratulations on the funding, a fantastic achievement um, by you and your colleagues. What have been some of the things that have made Smart successful to date? What have been some of the key success factors for you as a business? Sure. So I, I'm kind of stepping in here today. The the two co-founders, Andrew Evans and Will Wynn, are slightly busy at the moment. So Andrew's getting married at the weekend and Will, uh, Will's wife is just about to give birth to their third child. So um, you have the, or the, the, the negative of me rather than the, the positive of them. Um, <laughs> Don't but, say that. But Andrew and Will, they've known each other for many, many years. So they both began in banking and uh, Andrew went on to have an illustrious career in banking and finance. And after a couple of years, Will moved off and worked for eBay for a couple of years early on in the UK uh, and did very, very well there and then decided he wanted to launch his own thing. So he launched a, a company called Arena Flowers, uh, which began as a B2C flower delivery company, which is still going today. And the, for the, I think for the last eight years running, that's been ranked the number one ethical flower delivery business in the UK. And beneath that is also a platform business. So the, the platform there fulfills on behalf of or several household names. Um, and so after several years of running that, he and Andrew had gone out for dinner and were, were chatting about things. And um, they were talking about auto-enrollment. Um, so Smart launched publicly in 2015, was founded in 2014. Auto-enrollment began in 2012. The rollout began in 2012. Um, so it, in theory, you could say that Smart was a little bit late to that. Uh, but Andrew had looked at that market and then Will took a look at it from a technology and user experience point of view. And they realized that the market was being really, really underserved. Uh, so they, they got together and decided to build a business to put user experience first, put great digital technology first and really serve the initial customer, which was small businesses in the UK. And then, of course, with each small business signing up, they had a number of employees themselves who would be enrolled into the scheme. So secondarily, putting things in place so that members, uh, people who might be saving for the first time in or anything other than the state pension, uh, could understand what was happening with their pensions and could make changes to their contributions and get an idea of where that was going to take them in the future. So they built things really from, uh, from a user perspective. And uh, at the very beginning, I think on average, it would take an employer two to three weeks to sign up for mm-hmm. a pension under this new legislation, whereas with Smart pension, we managed to get it down to about 90 seconds. So wow. the, the gap there was just huge and the user experience was just so much better that even though smart pension was late to the market, it was able to grow really, really, really well. Um, and from a, from a technology point of view, from a user experience point of view, from a marketing point of view, everything went really well for smart pension. And then uh, there's a bit of a misnomer in pensions that, that systems are entirely different across the world. Uh, in fact, there's a fair overlap. So probably about 60 to 80% of issues within pensions overlap between countries. And so having done so well in the UK, uh, Will and Andrew decided to look abroad and see, well, could the technology we built support international systems? So first of all, there was a super successful business in smart pension in the UK. And then it took that next leap towards um, becoming a platform business and serving other markets. So those are two of the key things that push things forward on top of excellent user experience. So can you tell us, I'm, I'm tempted to ask you a question about ethical and unethical flowers, but I think that's more <laughs> of a rabbit hole. Um, <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about the plans for this funding round? Because the, the City AM article said you were planning for a flurry of deal making. Is that an exaggeration? Or what, what are the plans for, for some of the funding? Yeah, sure. I'm also tempted to jump off into flowers now as well, and uh, or and ethics as well. Interestingly, um, Smart also employs a guy called uh, Dr. Harry Brignall, who is famous for co- uh, for coining the phrase "dark patterns" uh, related to deceptive design. So, so 
Smart itself has a strong ethical angle as well. And of course, uh, democratizing pensions and making things available to people who might otherwise not be able to uh, have access or to understand them is also a big part there. Uh, in terms of the, the funding round, um, so, so what Smart has carried out various pieces of acquisition in the past. For example, um, what, about 18 months ago uh, in the States, acquired a business called Stadium, and that was integrated just over a year ago and has gone really, really well. Uh, and elsewhere has acquired a couple of other entities uh, from a talent point of view. And then also Smart Pension regularly um, acquires other master trusts and things like that. So, so growing in um, scale. So the business is very, very used to M&A, has a couple of great M&A people internally. Uh, and indeed, some of the, some of the funding round is based around that. Uh, and based around both sides of that. So other areas where we can use our experience and grow scale internationally, and also other elements to build up scale within smart pension, uh, which which has great benefits for everybody really. So smart pension, the tech is super, super efficient now. So it's valuable to us to acquire um, other master trusts and uh, grow in number of members, uh, but it's also super beneficial to employers and to the employees because of course, then you have um, all the, the shared resources of trustees and things like that. So rather than having to spend twice on things like that, um, you get the benefit of that. And uh, in terms of value, we try to pass as much of that back as possible um, to those employers and those members in fees. And so there's a good example of that. There's a master trust acquired last year and uh, each of the employers within that was paying a monthly fee and they no longer pay that fee. So there's a great saving for them. Uh, and then of course, from an investment point of view, growing the assets there is very, very useful and uh, helps in terms of deploying that to the benefit of all the members. Fantastic. Sophie, I'd love to bring you in at this point. Um, I this isn't the easiest of environments for um, fintechs to, to, to raise funds. How, how impressive an achievement is it to, to bring in a funding round in this kind of context? Um, what, what's your view on the sort of market more, more widely? Yeah, I'm glad that you asked me that question because I was going to butt in and make that exact comment. Um, it is absolutely a rough environment and specifically for fintechs. Um, as as, as um, listeners are probably aware, the, the public markets have massively been hit, um, you know, within the fintech um, industry. And so just investors are really scrutinizing fintech companies. It's really going back to fundamentals, revenue, growth, um, you know, unit economics, and then the ability to scale efficiently, effectively to be able to exit at a very, very large valuation. So if you can prove all of those things in, in, in this market and also, you know, be able to get people excited about the next phase of the journey, then it's, it's, it's a huge lift. And I think I would like to thank you on behalf of the fintech ecosystem because we need the funding environment to open up because there are a lot of great companies that are still out there that are suffering from this kind of a perception that, that fintech is, you know, is not the place to be at the moment when it absolutely is. We have not figured out all the problems. We still need to solve a lot of the problems. Um, so yeah, massive congratulations. Kate, how, how big a problem is this? So um, we've, we've heard Dan talking about you know some of the problems, but from your perspective, what, what do you think? How, how big is the pension problem? It's it's absolutely huge, yeah. Um, and I think you know, to Sophie's point about getting people excited about something, I think it's especially impressive to get people excited about pensions, which is something that just we as ordinary human beings just really struggle to kind of get our heads around. We know that people are very naturally short term in their thinking. Um, it's very, very difficult to plan for this really, really far off event, which is your retirement. Um, and our concepts of retirement are just completely shifting. So you know, my parents both worked for a single big corporation for their entire mm. professional lives. They retired depressingly early by my standards. Um, you know, my life, my professional life and my, my personal life around it is is completely different. You know, I'm in my 30s. I've already worked for multiple employers. I have multiple pensions in different places. You know, my age that I will be able to take the state pension has gone has gone down. Or, or sorry, has increased. And so the, the equation has completely changed. And I, I don't think we've yet provided the services to support customers through that. Um, there's still a massive... You know, auto enrollment has had a huge impact. It's been a really, really positive uh, thing. You know, we've seen it have a, a big 
increase the amount that people are saving and the types of people who are now saving for their pensions who just weren't before. Um, but there's still even further to go, like the, the deficit between the amounts of money that people are saving and the amounts of money that people are expected to need to, to live a life that they want to or expect to in their later life is, is still huge. So yeah, we, we definitely, I'm, I'm always excited to come across companies like Smart that are trying to tackle this space. It needs to be tackled. It's a huge personal issue for individual customers and it's a huge societal issue for us as a whole in the UK and other parts of the world. So um we need you know, to be able to not rely on the state to financially support us in our old age. We need to build our own savings and investments to to get us there as well. So yeah, it's a huge problem and one one that customers I think are still looking for help with definitely. Dan, I'll give the last comment on this story to you because it's, it's it's your story. Do you do you agree with Kate's um, sort of summary? Is that the the core of the problem that Smart is is trying to solve, or are there other other big things out there that you're trying to address for customers too? Yeah, I, I very much agree. And and pensions is kind of an undercovered area in the general press. So as as Kate said, it's an area that people do not understand nearly as well as they should, and. It, it, it's not really contextualized to, to the average person on the street very well. Uh, so, I mean, if, if you look at it, a pension is probably the largest saving pot that most people will grow in their lives. And yet day to day, people don't really think of it. So, mm. I mean, there's lots of talk about uh, rising cost of uh, cheese sandwiches and things like that, uh, which of course grab headlines and are nice short-term stories. But in terms of helping people in their lives, helping them to grow more money while they are working to support them in later life is just a huge, huge thing. Uh, yeah. And auto enrollment itself has been a really, really big success in the UK. Uh, it's it's modelled somewhat on the Australian system, which is also a really, really big success. And now it's nice to see that flowing or in other areas around the world. So particular states in America starting to roll that out, Ireland looking at that in the very short term, and then various states in the Middle East starting to roll that out. It's nice to see, as Kate said, rather than just relying on the state, who literally won't be able to take care of it, uh, finding a system between the state and employers and members which can put everybody in a better position in later life. So yeah, very, very much so. Fantastic. Well, congratulations again to you and your colleagues. And I'm sure we and, and all our listeners sort of wish you wish you and your colleagues every success in tackling some of these important challenges. And you have Sophie's thanks for sort of reigniting the, <laughs> the, the funding market. All right, let's move on to our next story, which is that Robinhood is launching 24-hour weekday stock trading. This was reported in Forbes. So Robinhood, the US brokerage, is allowing its customers to engage in 24-hour trading of selected exchange-traded funds and popular stocks such as Apple and Tesla. This marks the first US brokerage to offer 24-hour trading in individual stocks to retail customers, I believe. The feature was rolled out this week in a limited capacity and will be available to, by June to all users. According to Robinhood, apart from letting customers invest outside regular market hours, the new system will also benefit advanced traders by allowing them to act in real time to manage their portfolios and adapt to new information as it unfolds. Um, before I come to our panellists, I'm just going to report what you, our listeners, said. We asked you on LinkedIn whether you thought this was a good idea or a bad idea. 46% of you said you thought it was a good idea. Uh, 26% said it was a bad idea. 29% were unsure. Um, Kate, which camp are you in? Oh, I think, I mean, I've, I've not had a chance to kind of see the full details of like the journey itself. And to me, that that's really key. Because I think in principle, I think it is a good idea to give people the choice about when they, you know, when they want to invest. Like we're a society that is more global, is awake at different times. We're kind of starting to kind of recognize in our working lives that people will have you know, different levels of productivity at different times of the day. So in theory, you know, I'm a believer in choice, but I think that choice has to be bounded by kind of the right guidelines and the right guidance. Um, and I think it's also about the ability that Robinhood has to understand when you know, that freedom of choice is leading customers down paths where they're, they're exposing themselves to you know, risk that is not in their interests um, and is putting them in a in a sort of in a difficult position. So I want to kind of see what this journey looks like and also what the guardrails are that Robin Hood are putting in place. But you know, whilst I think it's potentially good to have that choice for customers, I am a little bit skeptical about 
you know, the timing of this, it kind of feels like Robin Hood have been going through a bit of a difficult patch. And it feels like maybe, you know, the skeptical part of my brain wonders if, if this is a bit of a PR stunt to kind of distract away from some results that they've announced recently that maybe aren't so great. Um, and they're struggling, I think, with the dip in retail investing. Obviously, it surged massively um, in, in 2021. So they're trying to kind of bounce back from that. So optimistic brain wants to see this as choice for customers. Pessimistic brain thinks, oh, is this PR? So yeah. Sophie, what do you think? Is is this is this Robin Hood acting in the best interests of its customers and democratising uh, access to the markets? Uh, or is this a way to make more money for Robin Hood or both? What do you think? Yeah, so I think, you know, the um, sort of line, which is the ability to react to, to sort of market news in real time is relatively interesting. I think there's also a kind of interesting comparison with the increasing... Um, sort of interest in crypto, which is 24-7 by its very nature. And so, you know, being able to allow traders to do the same sort of trading um, initiatives is is interesting. However, I do think that it, it just massively encourages day trading, um, which is one type of trading. And it will probably lead to bad um, sort of, um, you know, people doing bad things in terms of staying up all night and watching the news and, you know, it being this kind of obsessive, you know, thing to do rather than actually what you should be doing is long-term investing. It should be, you know, taking a state of companies, you know, viewing that on a week or month by basis and not obsessively watching the news to, you know, make a little bit of gain or loss on, um, you know, on a day-by-day basis. Dan, um, I imagine you're all in favour of short-term investments and and looking to roll this out to smart customers very soon. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, uh, well, uh, thankfully, I would say we're definitely not going to do that. Um, uh, but uh, in general terms, I suppose I agree with both Kate and Sophie. It, it feels like a broadly good thing. I presume part of it is uh, Robin Hood looking at things that they can do to push themselves ahead of competitors and uh, fight a bit against uh, uh, people paying more attention to crypto and things like that. Uh, so I think, yeah, guardrails is a very, very good idea. And uh, along with the things said so far by Kate and Sophie, I suppose another negative behavior it may encourage is people trying to hype things up in quiet periods and game the system, uh, mm-hmm. which obviously is a very negative behavior. And it would be a shame if some of the worst elements that you see in crypto markets make their way over. So. If those things, things could be protected against, that would be a good thing. But I suspect legislation and things like that will be a bit slower and Robin Hood themselves will have to be quite careful. So it's a really tricky issue, isn't it? Because there's this sort of balance between giving retail access, investors access to markets and you know putting retail investors sort of in the same position as institutional investors and not being sort of disadvantaged. And yet, on the other hand, you know, to, to your point, Sophie, there's this sort of, or the point all three of you made, this danger of um, opening up sort of addictive behavior because, you know, trading is fun, right? Or trading can be fun um, until until it goes down. Um, and there's this risk of opening up, um, opening up people to addictive behavior. Have we seen companies in other sectors or companies in financial services that are sort of handling that well? Um, is there a way to sort of, intervene and tell customers to stop? Have we seen good examples from sort of gambling or financial services industry of companies stepping in and saying to customers, you're not having fun anymore? Kate, what do you think? Well, I think we're still struggling in the digital banking space with that boundary between like guidance and advice. So I think we're not seeing kind of firms sort of intervene as much as maybe we would like them when there are these great risks of customer harm. You know, obviously we've celebrated in the past the initiatives that some of the digital banks have taken to allow customers to put in gambling blocks you know some of the kind of frictions that the likes of monzo and several other uk banks now allow customers to put in place so that they can block themselves from transacting against either like specific merchants or against merchant categories based on merchant category codes so i think that has been positive but i think yeah i think to me this feeds into the wider ongoing narrative that we're having as an industry about you know, what does guidance and advice look like in this new age of digital banking when customers are transacting more often, more frequently, more independently? Um, and so I think this this the reason why maybe we haven't seen as many interventions as we would like is is because firms are so shy and so anxious about 
falling on the wrong side of that, about intervening and, and stepping past what regulators see as the boundaries. Robin Hood never seems that concerned about boundaries compared with some other firms. Um, is there a risk here that Robin Hood ends up coming under a lot of regulatory scrutiny? I mean, Robin Hood's obviously had a, you know, a little bit of controversy in the past. You know, there was an awful incident where um, one investor had his balance appear to be zero and he thought he'd lost you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. He hadn't, but he went and committed suicide because he thought he'd lost everything. Sophie, do you think um, Robin Hood is sailing too close to the wind again? Yeah, I think, you know, there's been a lot of focus recently, especially within the banking industry on duty of care of customers. So um, not only should you maximise profit and value for your shareholders, but you also have a duty of care to do the best thing by your customers. And it feels like these technology companies that are pushing boundaries um, and trying to be innovative may sometimes feel like they're not having that duty of care as much as the kind of larger, more regulated banks. And so I think that there is a balance between, you know, continuing to innovate um, and be foreign honest, but also, you know, being ahead of regulation, which is always, always going to be slower than these fintechs. And do you, you know, do you put duty of care above growth and profit? And that's very difficult in this environment where um, your, you know, your investors are saying to you, we need to be, you know, continuing to grow and improve our unit economics and, and being seen as a front runner. It's a just difficult balance. But, you know, I, I would want to believe that, that that customers should always come first. So maybe the answer is... Um more sort of investment tests and and checking checking how well investors understand what they're doing and maybe you know looking at the sort of portfolio performance and so on to try and identify the investors who are taking decisions out of out of hours and are, are sophisticated and the investors are not sophisticated and potentially becoming um, slightly addicted. And I know that sounds a bit like a nanny state and I imagine some of our American listeners are listening in horror to this idea, but, but there needs to be some kind of guardrails in place, right? Well, let's move on. Um, so we're going to take a quick break. Before we break, a quick reminder that none of what we say is financial advice. So um, we're not advising you uh, to, to day trade or to buy stocks out of ours. That's um, a decision for you to make for yourselves. Um, so we're just going to take a pause very shortly and we will be back soon. A lot of you know 11FS for our chart-topping podcasts, our events, videos, reports, and a bunch of other cool stuff that we do. But what a lot of you don't know is that this is just all our side hustle. We do so much more than that. At 11FS Ventures, we're partnering with ambitious businesses around the world to design, build, and launch truly digital financial services. We are building banks, shaping new propositions, and growing existing offerings that change the fabric of financial services. And our design, research, strategy and engineering experts are working to improve your customer's relationship with money. To find out a little bit more, check us out at 11fs.com forward slash ventures. Welcome back. Uh, before we get to the second half of today's news, a quick note to go and check out the latest episode of our FinTech Insider Insights show. Could mortgages as a service mark the future of home buying? I was joined by a great guests from Molo Finance, Pexa UK, and 11FS to discuss this question. We had a fantastic chat on what embedded finance could bring to home buying, but also a robust look at some of the challenges uh, in the way. So go and check that podcast out uh, wherever you got this one. So let's get back into the news. Tiger Global is looking to cash in part of its $40 billion portfolio of private companies, according to the Financial Times. Technology-focused hedge fund Tiger Global is exploring options to cash in a piece of its more than $40 billion portfolio of privately held companies, according to reports. The New York-based investment group is working with an advisor to tap the so-called secondary market to help return money to some of its investors. Over the past few years, investors in fast-growing companies such as Tiger Global have been able to realize gains by taking companies public. However, initial public offerings have slowed over the past 18 months as investors grapple with wider inflationary pressures and stock market volatility. Sources told the Financial Times that other large venture capital firms have also been studying similar sales of parts of their private portfolios. Sophie, I'd love to bring you in as, as a venture capitalist. Um, what what is the secondary market and how common practice is this in in venture capital to sort of turn to the secondary market yeah absolutely so um 
obviously got two markets, the primary market and the secondary market. The primary market is when new securities are issued for the first time. So, for example, when Smart uh, raised their most recent equity round, a new um, security is issued. Secondary market is where a previously issued security or equity is then traded between investors. Now, it's actually not that uncommon in the venture capital industry at the moment, but it's used during a current funding round where you have a price in place. And it could be for various reasons. You could want to sort of buy out maybe some previous angels, clear up the cap table, maybe give the founders some liquidity as as companies are staying private for longer. Um, it could be the ability to sort of cash in some of their equity along the way. However, the interesting thing about what is happening with Tiger Global here is that it is not at a funding round. So we do not have a valuation um, for these um, secondary equity positions to be to be traded. So I think it's going to be going to be an interesting um, and relatively, I imagine, complex and long uh, process to get rid of some of these positions. Because Tiber Global is sitting on some quite interesting uh, investments, isn't it? Because it was an early investor in quite a few sort of Chinese startups and so on. So it's got, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting portfolio, um, but tricky to value. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's 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 got holdings in Stripe and Databricks um, in kind of, as you said, a lot of um, a lot of kind of very um sort of well-known Chinese tech companies. It, it's, it sort of was, was one of the first big growth investors taking this interesting approach, which is large tickets into companies that are sort of pre-IPO or a little bit before that. Um, and you are actually taking quite a lot of risk out of that because like you said, at the beginning, they were sort of taking these companies public. So, you know, l- lower risk, lower return, but, but kind of um, also, you know, they had a playbook. Now, as you say, IPO markets have have frozen, and so you're not getting those liquidity events. And I imagine their investors are looking for some of that cash to be returned. Um, and with the line of sight of IPO mm-hmm. markets unfreezing, unknown, then this is a way to generate liquidity. But at the moment, in terms of prices and valuations, the you know the prices that they're going to get for these is is likely to be very unfavorable compared to potentially when they got in. Dan, I'd love to bring you in here. Um, so obviously, you've just raised a whole bunch of funds from, from venture capital firms and others. How much are you sort of choosing your investors as much as they're sort of choosing to fund you? And, and how would you feel if sort of, one, you know, one of the venture capital firms sort of sold their stake in Smart off to, you know, someone else almost, sort of, you know, how do you feel about your relationship as a company with some of your um, venture capital firms? Yeah, it's an interesting question. And uh, as, or as Sophie was saying earlier, it's been a, an interesting uh, time to try and raise funds over the last year or so, whereas previously lots of things were based largely on the opportunity ahead. Uh, they're much more around things like annual re- annual recurring revenue and profitability and all of those kind of things at the moment. Um, Smart is in a super good position in that Smart Pension and the UK business has already reached both scale and profitability. Um, the, the tech side of things is slightly less proven than that, but of course is already present in a couple of places around the world. So as Sophie said, uh, Will and Andrew, the founders, and Owen, who heads up the finance side of things, have done a super, super good job in terms of uh, working with investors and putting us in a great spot. Um, so from that point of view, having a great business puts Smart in a really good position in terms of choosing um, who to work with. And uh, as Sophie said, in terms of secondaries, uh, when there is a round, when, or when there is an active round, it's quite a common thing. Uh, I think for us, we won't be in that position, thankfully, for the next while of having an investor um, looking away from us. Um, but I can see that for some companies, it would be a worry if they have someone who was previously very, very supportive, who's disappearing, and perhaps it shakes up the board and means their future path is in a very different position to where they thought it might be. Sophie, I want to pick back up on that comment you were making earlier about the sort of the uh, invisible end of the sort of IPO freeze, um, and there's sort a of question about when when we might get back to a time when when fintech companies in particular can can hope to float successfully on the public markets. How big a problem is that for the venture capital industry? Because presumably, that, you know, there's lots of funds 
in venture capital funds that are currently invested in all sorts of companies, including companies like, you know, Stripe, as you said, or, or ByteDance that are, you know, well established, you know, TikTok as owner, right? Really well established companies that, that could raise funds from probably a wide variety of places. Does that mean that the sort of venture capital industry is almost getting sort of stuck because it can't release capital and therefore it can't invest in new earlier stage startups? Is How, how big a problem is this? So the the problem is really, um, you know, to be able to raise your next venture fund, you need to have returned capital and multiples to show those current investors that, yes, you will get your money back and you will get a certain times your money back. Otherwise, you know, why are you going into this relatively high risk asset? Um, the the IPO market being shut down is, is bad in terms of a path to liquidity. However, that is just one path to liquidity. M&A is another path. Mm-hmm. And actually, what we're seeing is um, the M&A market picking up a bit more um, because you have these large corporates that have big balance sheets um, that are now looking at, a, a, you know, these assets that are essentially, quote unquote, on discount. Um, and so maybe more actively um, involved in the, the buy versus build side. Um, so for, you know, for this earlier stage, if you're investing in early stage like Anthem is, actually, we've got a long time horizon. So we can kind of wait this this hopefully blip out. However, if you're Tiger Global and you've invested purely on the fact that these companies will then IPO, you know, Stripe, we all heard, was on the path to IPO. They're huge companies with valuations that exceed multiple, m- many of the larger companies that could acquire them. So really, IPO is the only option. Um, and so that's where you're starting to get into this, this kind of higher risk in terms of being able to return liquidity to your investors, um, you know, so then you can get sort of future investment down the line. Got it. Kate, Sophie just talked about um, sort of bigger corporations potentially, you know, acquiring some of these stakes. Um, do you think there's appetite in banks um, to potentially pick up um, some of these startups out of VC, directly out of VC portfolios? Do you think we could see that happening a little? I think, yeah, I think it's definitely a, a possibility. You know, we know from the work we do with clients how challenging it is to build things from scratch, right? Like it's it's not easy. Like, you know, it can be done and it's been done really, really well in, in certain parts of the world. Um, but I think there's definitely a tendency in big companies to want to kind of accelerate things. So they want to, you know, the, the market is changing so rapidly. You know, some of these organizations, I think, just have no chance of catching up unless they get some sort of head start. So I could definitely see, as you know, Sophie says, in this environment where you might pick up uh, a discount, to give it, to use that term again, you know, that it might be more appealing than ever. And we know that you know, if we talk about banks specifically, you know, banks are still trying to work out their, their kind of long-term strategies. Do they build things themselves? Do they make acquisitions? Do they partner? And some banks have really nailed that strategy and some banks are still experimenting, you know, haven't really kind of got their partnership model sorted, haven't really worked out kind of what they feel they could build themselves versus what they what they would be more comfortable to sort of buy and try and blend into the organisation. So, yeah, I'm, I'm really intrigued to see how it, how it plays out. Fantastic. All right. Super interesting thoughts on, on that. Let's move on then to our next story which is that M. Copa has snapped up $250 million in debt and equity for its asset financing platform. And this was reported in TechCrunch. So M. Copa is an asset financing platform that offers underbanked African customers access to what it calls productive assets and the ability to pay for them via digital micropayments, which has secured uh, $250 million in new funding. The capital injection includes $55 million in equity and over $200 million in debt. MCOPA's business revolves around using debt to finance customers' purchases of products and services it sells, particularly smartphones and solar power systems, thus the sort of productive assets, as well as offering loans and health insurance across four markets, Kenya, Uganda, Ghana, and Nigeria. With its flexible credit model, the business allows individuals to pay a small amount for the smartphones and solar power systems and pay them off through micro installments, helping to build their credit history over time. So, super interesting business model. Um, Sophie, I think I'm going to come to you first. Um, this is a really interesting in a couple of ways. Firstly, it's a fintech in Kenya raising you know, a substantial amount of money. And secondly, it's a mix of equity and debt, which is a little bit more unusual. What did you, what did you think of this? So I think actually um, the mixture of equity and debt 
isn't as unusual as we would think. The cheeky thing that startups do is they combine the two. And so they ra- they say, we raised a total of, you know, in this case, like 305 million. The fact that they split this out, love it. You know, I, I'm, I'm all for transparency. Um, and so, you know, the, the, the fact that, that it, it is a financing company, you need debt for that. So the fact that they have now have a 250 million debt for um, what they call uh, micropayments is huge, right? It means that they are now set up to scale. Um, and I think the other interesting thing is that the, the opportunity in Africa is absolutely huge. And I think sometimes underserved by venture capitalists who feel, you know, like it's an environment or an industry or a regulatory sort of world that they don't understand, therefore don't feel capable of diligencing. And, but I think the opportunity, their kind of digital first, um, and like under, uh, banking the underbanked is really, really big. So it is very exciting to see that we are, you know, seeing investment in this space and seeing that a large amount of capitals are flowing into these companies to set up to scale and really, really take the market. And so you're saying that 200 million in debt that they've raised will be money that they're lending out to their customers as it gives them the capital to fund the lending. Yeah, I imagine so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah of course, I realise it's not your deal. <laughs> <laughs> um, Kate, how, how specific is this um, lending model to, to certain African countries? Or is this something that could go widespread? What, what do you think of this, this particular model? Um, I guess it depends on like what level you look at it. I mean, we've, it's this idea that you, you take a loan and then you pay it back in small but more consistent repayments, I think, obviously has had a lot of traction in African markets. But, you know, we do see examples of it in other parts of the world as well. So, um, you know, Square, for example, in their sort of business lending, you know, they have the integrations so that small businesses can pay back their loans with a percentage of every single kind of transaction that they they take. So we see kind of microfinancing in lots of different forms in, in lots of different parts of the world. But obviously in in these markets where maybe there is are less established credit models and having the ability to kind of try and maintain that consistent relationship with your customers, maintain that habit of easy and small repayment feels like a, a better model. Um, and you know, they've talked about helping customers to build a credit history as well. So I think it's kind of hopefully a, a beneficial model for, for the business itself, but also kind of for the customers to be able to take, take credit in a way that is safe and, and more secure for, for them to repay. Dan, this may be an unfair question because I don't know if this is this is your area, but I, I thought it was interesting that the lending is tied to smartphones and solar powered systems, what it called sort of productive assets, in a sense, trying to lend to customers for things that will help them rather than, let's say, I don't know, televisions or or whatever. Do you think, is that significant? Do you think is that, do you think that's an important, potentially interesting part of the, the business model here? Uh, I don't, or you, you were talking about it a bit earlier about uh, nanny statism and things like that. It, it feels like it, it blurs a little bit more over into that because I guess there are other productive things in people's lives other than, uh, other than phones and uh, <laughs> telling people what they, what they should be lending money for specifically uh, feels like it could be a bit harsh in some places. But uh, I think the overall idea of it is, is a great thing. It feels like it, it uses the best of, technology and uh, the ability to scale things to offer something to people that they would not have otherwise. And as long as it's handled well, then I think it could offer improvements to people's lives. uh, And that's always a good thing. So in a a sense, it's a similar principle to some of the elements of smart in that if you get a platform right, you can roll it out very, very broadly and drive down the cost of service to people to their benefit. Yeah, it's definitely very interesting that it's in, in, in four different countries, isn't it? Kate? I suppose one of the things that I thought was interesting, I mean, they've described it about being productive assets. Again, I sort of agree with Dan, like, you know, is it kind of a branding thing or is it? But I thought, well, it was interesting that you know, because of the things that they are lending against, they do have the ability to, you know, um, deactivate these devices or this equipment remotely if people don't don't make those repayments. So again, I think that is that is an interesting dynamic that they're lending against assets where they have more control, not only about like reclaiming that asset, but having that extra sort of stick to leverage against your customers if, if they're not repaying. So that to me seemed interesting. I was also wondering if there was a sort of credit risk dimension to it, that if they've sort of learnt over time that perhaps if you lend money to people for smartphones and solar panels, you're more likely to get it back than if you lend it to them for, for, for other assets, though, though I don't know that. Um, Sophie, there was another interesting thing in here, that, that this some of this debt financing was being led by Standard Bank. 
um, from South Africa, who've apparently sort of added some commitments around carbon reduction and and so on to to the terms of of, of this loan, um, which you know is great to see because it's good to see banks really trying to. Um, have a, a slight influence on climate change. Obviously, obviously, there's a drop in the ocean. Um, is that something you're seeing more widely, where investors are trying to sort of influence positive actions from from companies? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, at Anthemus, we've always had um, one of our our values is is no zero sum game. So you know, everything has to have a kind of positive impact and outcome um, in the world more generally. And I think we're we're seeing that specifically in the massive amount of capital that is flowing into climate solutions as well and new funds that are being set up specifically to look at that that side of it. Um, I think financial services has a huge um, role to play in this transition because, like you say, where you dictate where capital flows um, or also kind of, you know, as an insurance industry, how you insure and where you insure and how you kind of manage risk can be uh, all viewed through the lens of of sort of supporting climate change initiatives. And so, you know, while I think it is it's it's an interesting thing that that maybe is like you say sort of a drop in the ocean, I think it shows a change in um in you know, how how banks are are viewing this. Um but I, I can I can imagine there's only going to be more of this these sort of types of, of loans and instruments that, that are to come. Yeah, and I didn't I didn't mean to be dismissive by saying a drop in the ocean. I I merely mean there's a lot of work to do on climate change. hundred percent. But it, no, I, I got yeah, what you yeah, meant yeah. and I agree with you, so don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, a great, great by Standard Bank for for doing that and and you know setting setting a standard. I had fell in, fell into that trap. Anyway, good for good for Standard Bank for setting a, setting a good example. But also a really really interesting startup. Um, you know, I think really interesting. I love I love these um, startups that are trying to help people build credit, um, particularly in in markets where there isn't a good sort of credit rating system. So super interesting story, and I I hope they have uh, great success, um, and that we hear much more about them over the next. A uh, couple of years. Okay, so now we're going to move into the section of the show called Big Click Energy, uh, which is a quick fire roundup of a couple of other stories that we don't have time to cover at length. Kate, what have you got for us? Yeah, so our first story in this section comes from This Is Money, and that is uh, more red faces at Revolut after boss accidentally hits the wrong phone button, sparking a probe. Revolut said it was thoroughly probing a fiasco which involved its former UK head accidentally messaging a customer to say he'd be waiting for him in the garden with my shotgun. James Radford, who left the UK's most valuable fintech for unrelated reasons last month, inadvertently sent the message after receiving several complaints to his personal mobile. The irate customer sent a slew of text messages and voicemails to Radford after their Revolut business account was frozen. Radford, who was key to the platform's fight for a license, had meant to text someone else, don't worry, I'll be sitting in the garden with my shotgun waiting for him. It is understood this was regarding a suggestion the individual could approach Radford in person. A Revolut spokesperson said, we take allegations seriously and are investigating thoroughly. Um, We were having a a chat before we started recording about accidentally sending people things you didn't want to send them. Um, Obviously, I don't condone threatening anyone with shotguns, but I do kind of feel a little bit sorry for him. You know, receiving complaints to your personal number isn't fun at the best of times. And it's obviously a very turbulent time for him and you know, who hasn't accidentally called a message to somebody they shouldn't, but obviously like not great and good to see that Revolut are investigating it. Um, but I think the story I'm more interested in here is around a sort of now kind of increasingly established pattern of executive or sort of senior staff exits at Revolut. We're seeing kind of quite a drip drip of stories. So their chief financial officer has also just left the the firm um, for personal reasons. And his exit follows on from the departure of a number of senior employees kind of in the last year, kind of seemingly concentrated around the sort of risk and compliance space. So their UK chief risk officer, their UK head of regulatory compliance, and their UK money laundering reporting officer. So um, obviously, when you see churn like that, you can't help wonder what's what's driving it. Obviously, it could just be natural team churn uh, or, or something else. But yeah, I'll be keeping my eyes on it. Thank you. And one from me comes from India, which is that Zest Money's founders have resigned in the wake of a failed sale. The founders of Zest Money have resigned weeks after the Indian buy now pay later firm's planned acquisition by Walmart backed mobile payments giant PhonePay fell through. Chief Executive Lizzie Chapman 
CFO and COO Priya Sharma and CTO Ashish Anantharaman have all stepped down, according to an email sent to staff. Phone P walked away from a deal pegged at between $200 million and $300 million, despite the fact it would have secured Phone P a long coveted non bank financial company license in India. According to their sources speaking to the Economic Times, Phone P was concerned about Zest Money's business model and debt liability, as well as India's increasing regulatory scrutiny of digital lenders. So, this is a, you know, this is a sorry story. Um, it's, I always say it's easy to lend money. It's very hard to get it back. And we're seeing a number of buy now, pay later firms really struggling um, because they lent out a lot of money and they're struggling to get it back. Zest Money is in some financial trouble. Um, that was partly why they were keen to sell to PhonePay. Um, PhonePay has actually uh, taken on a number of employees from um, Zest Money. Um, but clearly the three founders are taking the taking the flack for the situation the firm has ended up in it's unusual to see three founder three senior executives go together and you sort of wonder is there a bit more to the story um it's also sad to see a female led business uh, losing its uh, chief and um chief operations officer because there aren't enough uh, female led businesses as it is i suspect we'll hear a bit more about this because i think there's probably more to this story um but always sorry to hear about a business in trouble Okay, let's bring everybody back for the final section, looking at a more light-hearted story from the past week, which is that um, a former UK Chancellor of the Exchequer, George Osborne, is to chair the Italian investment firm Lingotto. And this was reported in City AM. Lingotto Investment Management, backed by Italy's Agnelli family, has hired former UK Chancellor George Osborne as a non-executive chairman. Owned by Exor, the Agnelli family holding company, Lignotto had around $3 billion in assets under management at the end of March. Since leaving public office in 2016, Mr. Osborne has acquired a considerable number of high-profile jobs. He has served as editor of the Evening Standard newspaper from 2017 to 2020, chair of the Northern Powerhouse Partnership, founding partner of venture capital firm Nine Yards Capital, chair of the British Museum, an investment banker with Roby Warshaw, director of his family's wallpaper making business, Osborne and Little, and a consultant in the sale of Chelsea Football Club. So, how many jobs is too many jobs? Um, Dan, what do you think? Uh, well, I, I, I guess he has slightly more than most people, um, but I'm, I'm very much on the side of things that uh, you can have more than one job and uh, those things be complementary and those things add value to each other. And I guess in the position he's in, he probably has a lot of help in all of those different areas. So I think as long as he's very well organized, um, that's okay. I guess there is the, the question of whether those things conflict with each other in one way or another. And uh, I guess that will have been thought about in going into it and it'll have been declared to all of the people he's working with um, in, in general in those terms as well. Uh, or I work across a couple of things. So I'm a non-exec on a couple of things. And uh, the two founders of Smart, Andrew and Will, are very, uh, keen on giving back in multiple ways. So Andrew's on the board of uh, Anna Freud, the mental health uh, charity. And Will, of course, was the founder of Arena Flowers and chairs the board there, as well as chairing uh, an AI startup called Trulliance. So I think there are definitely places where it can be beneficial all around. Um, with George Osborne, I guess I would leave it up to him, but I don't know how he has time to do anything else other than all of these multiple roles. And uh, I'm, I'm if I was him, I'd be worried about burning out personally. <laughs> Sophie, what do you think? I mean, do, 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 do investors worry about executives having too many roles? Do you worry about you know, executives in some of your portfolio companies getting getting distracted? Um, what do you think investors will think of this? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we, we would have to have a very uh, strong reason why uh, anyone on the founding executive team was doing anything else than, than the business, especially when you're giving them millions of pounds you quite want to be focused on the thing that you're giving the millions of pounds for um however this is a this is a ned role so or, or non-exec chairman so obviously it's not as sort of time intensive um i, I just think it's mad how different these jobs are you know like I, <laughs> I sit on a couple of boards but they're all fintech companies i can imagine an editor versus chair of the british museum versus a vc is relatively different skill sets. So, and wallpaper. And wallpaper, right? You know, like 
very different. So um, I, I just be interested to see how he takes learnings from those industries and, and carries them across. Kate, Kate, what did you think? Um, uh, the Agnelli family owns Juventus Football Club. You know, um, what, what do you think is going to happen next? Yeah, I mean, maybe he's going to pop up, pop up in the stands. I don't know. Maybe like I feel like he couldn't be a football manager. Surely, like that would just be too, too much. But I don't know. Maybe I feel like public schoolboy confidence still gets you an alarmingly long way in in public life in the UK. So um, yeah, I suspect probably the main thing that links all of those, all of those roles is the fact that he's prominent and probably very intelligent and also very very confident um so that that goes a long way but yeah i mean i don't really i hope he doesn't go into football that would be that'd be quite depressing i think when you say confident you mean overconfident however i'm not going to correct you um if we were if your if our panel was going to pick up a second job what would be your dream second job and it sounds like um sounds like dan and so if you already have a second job so let's say you had a, an unrelated second job um sophie what was your uh second job be if you had a dream second job i always say that i'd quite like to be a blue peter presenter because oh. you get to like just do really fun stuff um and travel the world and just like have dogs so yeah that's can, that's can you tell our do. international listeners what blue peter is please oh man yeah blue peter is, is is it still on i don't know if it is it's a children's program that was on after you came back from school um and the four presenters would like make stuff out of loo roll and uh try out new cool stuff like go-karting um it was all very wholesome and lovely kate what about you um i'm just actually i'm now just worried like does blue peter still exist because i've got a badge somewhere that you know and i don't know if it's still worth anything um my main, I mean, I obviously love my primary job, but at, at its core, like, I'm just a people watcher. So I feel like any second jobs which just enable me to observe people in the wild doing fun things. Um, so I think I'd quite like to be like a, a platform announcer on the London Underground. Like, I think they have a really fun job. Like when the, when the tube is like really, really busy, like it's our underground metro system again for international listeners. Um, and I just feel like it'll be really satisfying to be able to kind of like help people and be amidst all of that um, especially when people are like running for the doors like kind of sprinting to get on that train that's just about to leave like being able to kind of say like you can make it you can do it i think i think i'd quite enjoy that and what about you dan uh, so i'm terrible uh, both my parents were social workers and uh, uh led lives helping people push forward their their lives so i always feel slightly guilty that i don't do enough of that so for me i'd probably do something like work for a homeless charity help people get back on their feet and move forward with things oh fantastic um i i could not do kate's job because that would be underground and i would hate <laughs> not seeing natural light i think if i had a dream second job it would be something like a forester i'd like to be outside um doing active things i spend too much time in an office um and apparently blue peter has been running for 65 years and is still running kate so you can set Phew. your mind at ease Phew. Okay, well, that wraps up um, today's news show. Thank you all so much uh, for joining me. It's been fantastic having you on. Where can people find out a little bit more about you? Uh, Kate? Um, you can contact me, Kate, at lemonfest.com by email or on LinkedIn, Kate Moody, or on Twitter at K8Moody. And Sophie? Yeah, you can um, check out more about Anthemus at anthemus.com um, and you can find me on Twitter at Sophie Winwood. And Dan? So you can find me on LinkedIn, Dan Barker. And if you want to find out more about uh, Smart Pension, the UK pension scheme, that's smartpension.co.uk or about the global group, that's smart.co. And if you're looking for a kind of entry point into how uh, savers see the 62 trillion global retirement savings market, if you go to smart.co slash future, there's a good report summing up the, the thoughts of 8,000 people in various markets across the world on how they see the future of retirement savings. Oh, I might go and download that. Thank you. And as for me, Benjamin Ensor, you can find me on LinkedIn, uh, or you can find out all about the great work uh, the team are doing at 11fs.com. So thank all of you for listening. Um, we hope you enjoyed the conversation. Please do uh, let us know what you think on social media or email us at podcasts at 11fs.com. Thank you all so much for listening. Have a great day and goodbye. <laughs>